Hey everybody, this is Mike. Welcome back to the Z Motorsports Shop and Channel. Uh, this is going to be part one of my uh, LS into my JK uh, swap. So I'm um, going to be, I don't know where I'll break them at or whatever, but there will be multi-series uh, videos going through this uh, engine swap. Um, and again, we're just, uh, we're going to be putting a 6.2 liter LS um, it's, this is the truck SUV engine. This is what you'll find in the uh, uh, trucks, Escalades, Denali's um, from 10 to 14. And then also a, a 6L80 transmission and the 241J uh, Jeep transfer case. So this is going to be the drivetrain that I'm, I'm putting into our 2011 uh, JK Unlimited Rubicon. So I'm um, just back up, give you a little preface on it. Uh, the Jeep. Has a little over ninety, has about ninety, um, a little over ninety-two. I think it's about ninety-two thousand five hundred miles on it. Um, I've put about ninety thousand of those miles on it. We bought it with about three thousand miles on it in late twenty eleven, and I immediately went through and put a four and a half inch lift under it. Um, it started out as a BDS lift, but I did not. After a couple of years, I didn't like the bushings and so forth that was in the having to keep replacing, warranting the bushings. So. I built my own links for it. Um, the rear springs started sagging a little bit, so just to bring you up to this point, what we've done, what I've done right now in order to get ready to prepare for this swap is, I, as I said, I was running 538 gears on it before with 35 inch tires on that four and a half inch lift, and that's been in that way, that way for the last, geez, seven, well, seven years now and about 90,000 miles. So. In order to prepare for this, I replaced my sagging, my rear spring. I got the rear end with tools and so forth loaded up pretty heavy in this, plus the bumpers and tire carrier and whatnot. So I don't have a lot of armor under it because I don't, I don't, I don't try, I don't like beating and relying on the armor. I've got the factory skids under it, and then um, I try to stay up above them and not drag on the bottom as much as I can. I've got a few scrapes and scratches on my control arms, so forth, but. In order to prepare for this build, um, I've replaced the sagging BDS springs with some Curry dual rate. They're the four and a half inch springs that are the Expedition um, springs. So they give a little, a little more uh, lift in the rear and that, that brought it up about three quarters of an inch in the rear that it was sagging. So it's, it's still, it's, I like the way it sits, but it's to bring some of that lift back that I was losing, that I'd lost. And then also I was running 538 gears uh, about a week and a half or so, about two weeks ago, I guess, I had switched over and put 456s in my front end as well as did a drag link flip in order to accommodate the space for um, my hydraulic uh, assist steering. And then um, and originally I've been, I've been running the PSC XD2 gearbox in this. When I first started looking at doing this swap about four years ago, um, the PSC, XD gearbox was compatible with the LS's at that time. So I put, about a year or so ago, I put the gearbox in this, not knowing that there was an XD1 and an XD2 that were different sizes. So the PSC XD2 gearbox will actually make, it, it actually will interfere with the AC compressor if you run the JK accessories on the engine. So I did not know that a year ago when I put the PSC gearbox on. Otherwise, I would have just gone right to the hydraulic steering. Um, once I determined that, oh, probably six months ago when I started collecting pieces for this build, I realized that. So if you're planning on doing this, just be aware of that. If you have an XD1, the first generation, it, I'm told, I haven't done it, done it, but I'm told it will work with the JK accessories on the LS but the XD2 gearbox will not due to the, the, just the basic, the, the sheer mass of the, the size of the gearbox. So I've ported, or had my, my OEM box ported and for the LS, for the V8, and then I'm running a redneck ram uh, hoses and, and, and ram and stuff, one and a half inch ram on the front, because I figured with, with, with double the horsepower, double the torque, I'm gonna step with 37s, so I've also, while I was doing that, I flipped the drag link to create the space I needed between the tie rod and the drag links, and then also while I had the front axle out, I cut off 
the factory bra uh, track bar bracket on my Pro Rock 44 and welded on the Arctic Industries uh, raised track bar bracket, which is very beefy. And then I actually gusted it a little bit more just because I, know I, was, I knew I was gonna be putting the hydraulic steering on. So I did all that. And then I just did the rear end, with, took the 538s, put 456s in it about a week, about a week ago, I guess. Yeah, it was about a week ago. So I've got about 300 miles on these gears. Um, just wanted to make sure there was no issues, make sure everything was handling properly, made sure everything chassis-wise and suspension-wise was spot on before I dove into the engine build, or the engine part of it. So now that that's taken place, um, I just pulled it in, I got it all cleaned up, and just pulled it in, and I am going to start draining fluids and disconnecting the electrical and so forth and getting ready to separate the body from the frame. Um, I don't have a ton of accessories on it. Um, I did have some rock lights that I, in three years, I used them once. So while I was doing gearing, I went through and pull all, pulled all those out. I, I, that's just, I don't like wheeling at night. I don't know why I ever put them on there. It was kind of a waste of time and money. Um, the other thing that makes mine maybe a little different than some of the other ones was that I, I, I flat tow this behind our motor home. So I've got the wire run down through my left frame rail and then it pops out back by the left tail light and ties in so that, and then up to my front under my bumper where I plug into my coach. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and pull the tail light and disconnect that. Um, that's really the only thing unique I guess I have on the back of this. And then other than that, it's just gonna be all factory, um, factory connections and factory wiring, a few relays and so forth up on the firewall. Um, I'll probably just disconnect the load side leave the control side and everything there that's tied to the body um, and leave as much of that intact as possible. So uh, anyway, um, back to the engine. Again, it's a, it's, it, it, it's a 2010 through 14, 6.2 liter. This is the truck SUV. You can get the LS3, which is a little more horsepower. It has about 25 more horsepower, but only about six or seven more foot pounds of torque. Um, I preferred the truck Denali Escalade SUV engine, namely because low end torque. It's a VVT engine, it's discrete VVT, it's not like the Gen 5 engines that are uh, CVVT, continuously variable valve timing. These are discrete, but the low end torque that these engines put out, I mean off idle, right off idle you have over 350 foot pounds of torque available right on tap. Um, they'll, they should move this heavy J or any heavy JK for that matter, very easily. Um, you don't have that, that choppy idle. They idle smooth all day long. Um, I chose to go that route. Uh, I was having a tough time finding one. Um, I did find, finally found a low mileage L, uh, L9H out of, which would have been my, which would have been my preferred um, engine and tranny. Um, I found, found it, but the engine was already spoken for. It had 38,000 miles on it. The engine was already spoken for. I tried to negotiate with the guy who was buying it. Um, he wanted the engine for a, a street rod project, I believe, hot rod, something. But I did get the transmission, and then I lucked out and found an actual L94 crate engine. They do not make this engine anymore. They don't make it in a crate format. I Dumb luck, I just happened to find one. Um, you can get a long block, um, but you cannot buy these motors as a crate motor anymore. GM does not offer them. So this is right, this is a crate motor, L94, 400 plus horse, I think it's like, I think it's like 403 or 404 horsepower, 417 something or other, I think it's 417 foot pounds of torque. Um, the tune I'm gonna be running in this is pretty much a stock tune, tweaked just a little bit to firm up the shifts and maybe bump it a few horse, I'm told maybe four, four and a quarter horse, maybe 440, 435, 440 on the torque. So it's gonna put it up there at least right, right with the LS3, but it's gonna be lower RPM torque. I like the, the, the taller truck manifolds do make it a little more problematic getting them to fit under the hood. I'm not running any special hood. I'm not running any, I'm just running the factory JK hood. Um, it is gonna be a little tighter than the LS3 
but I, the gear again, I really wanted the low end torque and um, idle smoothness and everything of the truck SUV engine versus the LS3. So I'm not taking anything away from the LS3. The LS3 is a great engine. Um, uh, no problems at all with it. You could put it in and actually have a little bit more hood clearance and a little bit more room in the engine bay. Um, but again, I wanted the, the uh, truck SUV engine mainly because of the low end torque and the idle smoothness. Um, not that the LS3 idles rough, it's just this is what I would, uh, this is what I really wanted um, versus the LS3. So the LS3 is a simpler engine. It doesn't have the VVT, it doesn't have um, AFM, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, block the AFM out of this, the uh, air fuel uh, management system, just because in a heavy Jeep, I don't see it being beneficial at all, and I really don't wanna deal with that going in and out of four cylinder mode. Um, the, in the Gen 5 engines, the, the uh, AFM mode works great, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to turn it off and uh, tune it out in this, in this situation. So um, it's just going to be a, 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 an emissions, it's going to be all US EPA compliant. I've taken everything from the GM, <coughs> excuse me, everything from the GM vehicle that's EPA certified is going to be brought over into the Jeep right down to the, evapor the EVAP system. Um, the Jeep EVAP system is pretty primitive. Basically, it just uses pressure in the tank to control that um, uh, EVAP uh, management system. Uh, the e the e EVAP system integrity monitor, the eSIM, um, whereas the GM is a closed monitoring system, so it has a, a purge valve and a vent valve all monitored through the, PC, through the ECM. Um, so it's going to be actually more EPA compliant or more, e more emissions friendly, let's put it that way, more emissions friendly than even the, vehicle, the engine that's in the, the Jeep. So um, again, this is going to be stage one. I'm, this is probably not going to be a step by step. Um, this is going to be something where if, you've, if you're familiar with engine swaps, if you've done engine swaps before, this is probably not going to be anything that somebody can't do. This is going to be one that is going to be, the, the, the big, biggest issue with this one is going to be the electrical and the electronics and the CAN bus system from the uh, Jeep tying into the network on the GM side. That's going to be the, that, that in the, as far as engine swap goes, is probably the, the biggest hurdle, if you will. Um, my intention with this all along was drivability. I want the drivability back. Everybody who drove these 3.8s, 3.6s are a little bit better, but I'm still not really all that impressed even with 3.6s. The 3.8 is, um, it, it, it was okay for its intended purpose, which is a minivan. It's just not meant for a heavy Jeep that the Chrysler knew we were going to be modifying. So I wanted to bring that fun factor back into the Jeep. I love my Jeep. I love drive. It's a daily driver, weekend wheeler. It's also our toad that we tow behind our motorhome. And I plan on racking up the miles on this thing. So I want a drivability. I want reliability, and I want dependability. So uh, as well as all the as well as the performance. Um, Performance was not number one, but it was, all of them are close in there. So I want this thing to where if the wife wants to hop in it, she can stick her key in the ignition, turn it, fire it up, and it's going to perform drive-wise as, as she's going to swear she's just in a, in a in, in, I want all the bells and whistles, I want all the, the uh, um, dash indicator lights, everything to function properly, but with better power and performance under the hood. So I think this, I think the 6.2 liter is probably more than enough. And the 6L80 is, is going to be a great combination for both on and off road. So I'm very excited about this. I've had this kind of been playing in my head for about four years now. I began, sp I began speaking to Robbie over at MoTeC, kind of picking his brain a little bit about mainly the integration of the, the ECM and TCM in, in the communication or that handshake, if you will, with the Jeep. Um, CAN bus system, and then with the m selling our old home, moving, building the shop, putting the yard in and everything in the last couple of years, it's kind of fell by the wayside just because other things were, took priority. And I'm finally to the point, I started in about June, July, started collecting pieces again, and finally um, collected all the pieces and parts, so I'm ready to lift the body off and perform this modification. So I'm very excited. I welcome you to come along with the, on the adventure, and I hope that I don't bore you to death. So 
Um, again, it's not going to be a step-by-step. -step. It's just going to be some random videos of the, of the build. Anything that I think that may be of importance, I might um, I'll throw out there. But if you're interested in doing this, there's a lot of research you want to do. I probably can't. I'll, I probably don't have the time to answer all your questions. Like I said, this has taken me several years of research and so forth. This is not something that you all of a sudden one day decide to pull the trigger and have all the parts on your doorstep tomorrow. This takes some thought, it takes some dedication, and it takes some research. So I'm, I'm encouraging you to do that. Um, all I'm trying to do is provide a little extra information than what's out there. Because there's, there's some out there, but there's not a ton. So, um, and like I say, there are quite a few of these Jeeps out there, but there's not a lot when you look at how many Jeeps are on the road. It's a very, very, very small percentage of Jeeps out there with, with LS engines in them. Um, in comparison to how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of Jeeps are out there. So uh, it's going to be unique. My Jeep is very clean. I, 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 I've kept it that way. I wheel it. I, I, I drive it like a, like a baby carriage off-road. I don't flog on it. I don't hammer it, but I do wheel it. Um, on, same thing on-road. I do drive it, um, but I take care of it. So I plan on having this Jeep a long time. My goal is at least fifth, another 15 years. I've had it seven now. I want to have it at least another 15 and I want it to be in pristine condition. And I want it to perform. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to start disconnecting things, get this body lifted off of here. A um, couple things I'm going to point out as we go along. Um, the L94 hat, this ha has the truck SUV manifolds on it. I actually purchased the Trailblazer ma exhaust manifolds. They clear, they seem to clear the frame a little better and open up the gap underneath. So I'm going to be putting those on and then I'm going to be running um, some, some of my, uh, a lot of the parts I bought through my local GM dealer. Some of them I bought off the donor, some of them I got with the donor vehicle. Um, other ones I sourced through my local Napa and um, a few parts, well quite a few parts actually I got through Robbie over at Motec. I didn't I kind of piecemealed it. I do like his um, billet brackets because they're not only do they look nice, but they're they're functional. He did a really nice job designing them, and they put all the JK accessories right back where Jake, where, where Chrysler intended them to be. So um, another big thing with this is repairability. You get into a small little town, which my wife and I travel a lot. Um, we tow this down into Texas and Arizona, New Mexico, all these little towns. If I get in there and I find I blow a, uh, I need a belt or I need an AC line or something, I want, I want to be able to go get the parts I need and without having to custom build things. I've had custom built vehicles for the last 35 years now. I've been a mechanic for 30 plus years and I've done a lot of engine swaps and I've had all the custom built stuff and one-off pieces and parts and that's all well and great for a street rod or something but for a daily driver something you're going to drive you know out of town and so forth it really is not conducive when you start getting out of town and having parts needing parts and come to find out you need a, a mill or lathe to machine that one part um, that you need so I'm trying my my goal with this was to keep it as OE level as possible so that I can go to a Napa or a GM dealer or wherever and get the parts I need um, if I break down out of town. So no different than if I was driving a Denali um, uh, SUV. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and get this sucker up to park, All right, shall so we? I'm about two hours into it here now, so I'm just going to briefly run over what I've done up to this point. So starting at the passenger side of the engine bay. You can actually see I removed the battery. Um, I've got a lot of wiring that I've added over the years for accessory lighting and so forth, some of which I've removed. So I'm going to condense that wiring probably into one convoluted um, tubing that runs right across with um, the factory um, OEM loom right there. Uh, and, and like I said, I've, there's probably three or four of those wires are going to be eliminated. So there's probably only going to be two, maybe three um, wires remaining there in addition to the factory loom. So all that's going to be going away. I'm just going to combine every stuff I've added in different phases. And uh, I'm just going to combine them all into one tubing. I'm um, coming around back around this way. Here's your tip -em. 
Air box obviously is removed. I've got the power steering pump disconnected from the bracket and just leaned over here. This is another reason why I wanted to have my hydraulic assist steering done prior to this transplant because there should really should be no reason why you even have to open this power steering system up. So that's another reason why I wanted to get all that done. So it took me a little few tries pulling the pump apart and playing with the pressures on that, but I finally got my hydraulic assist where I'm happy with it. Um, let's see, all my hoses are removed. I added a, oh, you can see it, I added a oil pressure sending unit down here um, right when I first got the Jeep, and that goes to my A pill, my, my oil pressure gauge up on my A pillar. I will, once I get the engine or the body off, I'll probably remove that and reuse that on the new LS because I want to keep my A pillar gauges. I have a voltmeter, transmission temperature, sending unit, and oil pressure gauge up in my A pillar. So I want to keep those analog gauges. Um, everything else I'll be able to monitor through my um, Aero Force gauge that I'm going to install. Um, once I get up in the air, you can see my transmission lines down there. I'll have to disconnect those transmission lines. I've actually tapped into them for my auxiliary cooler. So the auxiliary cooler is going to stay. I've got a pretty good size one on this. It's an 11 inch by 11 inch by one and a half inch thick stacked plate design. So that will stay. Um, let's see. All my, obviously my coolant reservoir bottle has gone. I got my belt off. All my hoses are really disconnected and just kind of leaned out of the way over here, heater hoses. Um, all the wiring from the um, Jeep PCM connectors. Uh, starting at the fender, it goes one, two, three, four. You'll actually leave number three. That's tied in to the, that stays with the body. But one, two, and four are removed. All the way back to the C100 harness. Um, disconnect that, and all that wiring goes laid over onto the motor. I just got a bungee cord right now holding it onto the top of the motor so nothing snags when I'm trying to lift the body. Um, speaking of connectors, um, for orientation purposes, here's your fan. Right down here you can see the C300 connector. That connects over to a plug, kind of hard to see, right down underneath the air box here. So that is your basically your chassis to body connector. So that will be disconnected. There you go, you can kind of see it right there. That will be connected, disconnected and just left. Uh, the body side will stay with the body and the frame side will stay with the frame. Um, coming around this other side. Uh, let's see. The, um, like I see all the, the C1, 2 and 4 are disconnected. All the way back through here to the booster up and over to the booster to the C100 connectors here and laid over on the engine. Um, there's a bolt right here that goes through this uh, composite body or a uh, uh, bracket here and holds into the ABS module on the side. You'll want to pull that bolt, that's a shoulder bolt, pull that out and you'll see two grommets right there. It takes a little bit of work but you, you'll basically just walk the uh, module up and then disconnect your master cylinder from your booster. Now, when you do that, there's an O-ring, which is a video right there. Sometimes it sticks to the booster itself. Make sure you grab that O-ring, because otherwise, when you go to assemble it, I've seen people actually accidentally push those inside, and they go inside your booster. So um, pull that out with your module and master cylinder, and then you should be able to just move the, the, the ABS stuff will just kind of push off to the side. Um, once I get ready to lift the body, I'll probably bungee those over a little bit to hold them out of the way of this bracket here. Um, then your vacuum line, um, leave your check valve in because you will be reusing that um, with the new with the LS. And then over here you've got your um, pressure sensor for your AC system. You also right there is your compressor, uh, connector for your compressor. And then up on top here, your alternator, there's a plug right there, you'll disconnect all that. That all goes with this harness and goes over onto the engine. So those will be um, back on once the, um, the LS goes in, you'll put those back over on the LS. Uh, speaking of battery cables, I've undone the battery cables from the battery. There's a right behind the battery box on the firewall, there's a ground and then also a ground strap that goes from there down to the engine. 
disconnect that, and basically you'll just fold the battery wire, the cables, the, the, the loads cables, right over onto the engine. Here's your battery cables. Those will more than likely be reused if they're in good shape, which mine are. So just take and put those right over onto the motor for the time being. So that's pretty much it in the engine bay. Oh, and I also you can kind of see some liquid down in there. I've, while I was uh, doing some of this other stuff up top side, <coughs> I went ahead and dumped the cooling system. So I just got that, let, letting that drip out. Um, I'm going to go do a couple things on the back of the Jeep now. I've got my CB antenna and the, um, my tow package uh, lighting for my tail lights for when we tow it behind the coach. I'm going to go back and do those right now while the cooling system is finishing draining. And then at that point, I should be able to get it lifted up in the air, drain the rest of my fluids, and start on doing body bolts. So this is about where two hours. If you're a little faster, maybe a little sooner, but this, I'm into it right now about two hours. And this is where we're at. All right, so we're about four and a half hours in, um, and the body's ready to come off. So let me just kind of take you around real quick and show you what needs to be disconnected in order to separate the, frame, uh, the body from the frame. And then remember, these are Jeeps. Every Jeep is different, so everybody adds things on a little differently. Um, luckily, I own this in stock, so I know where everything's been added on, such as my CB antenna and my uh, oh, uh, third brake light. And I, when I put those in, I put weather pack connectors up underneath, so I was able to disconnect those and let them hang here. Um, my trailer for my tow package for my lighting that runs down the frame rail I had to re go up into the, the left rear tail light and disassemble that so that's all hanging here um, if you uh, if, 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 if you have one that has been towed or that you tow just don't forget that some people will run down the body I chose to run my wiring down the frame and then come out of the frame up to the body so as long as you're aware of that but that's, that's where your differences are going to be other than that, um, I'll grab the camera here and go handheld hold real quick and just kind of run you around and show you the main things that you need to um, disconnect and then anything above and beyond that from accessories, you're kind of on your own. Okay, so again, here's, these, are, these are accessories here, but you're going to have a um, body mount bolt right rear back here, right at the uh, very rear corner. Now up until oh, 09 or 10, I'm not sure which. They put another one right up here, just in, just forward of the shock mount, the rear shock mount. Um, this one does not have it. This is an 11, so it does not have that. So you're gonna have two back here at the rear. Um, one other thing, here's your, here's my axle vent line. Mine's actually clipped to the frame, but keep in mind if yours actually attaches to the body, um, remove that. Then over here is your fuel fill. And evap lines, there should be a small, about a 3 8 inch vacu or a evap line. Your main fill, there's the 3 8 there's the fill. And then your um, line that goes down to your evaporator, your eSIM, your evaporator system integrity monitor, is going to be this one right here. And it's about a 5 8 one. Disconnect those. And that really should be at about back here. But like I said, if you have it set up for trailer towing or anything like that, just make sure that you disconnect all those lines. Moving forward, emergency brake cables. Those are quick and simple. Just pull them out and disconnect them from the lever. And let them hang here. Okay, moving forward more. On the outside of the frame rails, you've got uh, one, two, and three body mounts to the middle, middle of the Jeep. I went ahead and pulled my drive shafts before. You can do that after, however you want to do it. Um, I drained all my fluids as well. I drained transfer case, transmission, and engine oil. Um, transmission shift linkage, disconnect. Those stay, uh, and the transfer case. That's supposed both will stay with the body. Um, I've got an advanced adapters cable on mine. That's why it probably looks a little different. Um, let's see. Here's a wire that I had added for a transmission temperature gauge. So I made sure and disconnect that. You will want to reach up underneath here and undo the driver's side upstream O2 sensor. Um, so that uh, stays, stays there. And here's the ground wire that come loose from up by the battery box. I pulled it down. Again, remove my front drive shaft as well. 
transmission cooler lines because my cooler was, will be staying with the body. I've got an aftermarket stacked plate transmission cooler. It's going to be staying with the body going up. Um, move around here more to the front. There's my power steering cooler. Uh, it'll stay with the frame right outside the frame. Right there is your front um, frame mount, body mount, sorry. Um, also look at the position in those. Mine, both sides are pretty much dead center in the hole. So that's what I'll shoot for when I'm going back together. Here's the other side, right there. So, and I think that's pretty much about it. Again, everybody's gonna be different, but that's what you wanna, those are the main items you wanna shoot for. And then here's, I don't know if you can see it or not, uh, step top side I showed it where the C300 connector was. This is where this is the actual right here. This is the main C300 wiring, but it's uh, push pinned into the frame, so that'll, this end will stay with the frame. Okay, and that's pretty much it, and the body's ready to raise up. Should just be the suspension relaxing. Okay, we're good back here. Let's, um, we want to watch for is any wires that I may have overlooked. I don't think we're connected anybody by fasteners, but fuel fillers disconnected, we're good there. Oh, I know one thing we need to do. I'll have to have you grab the step stool. Okay, watch for Okay, brake lines, everything clear, everything's clear back here except for brake, e-brake cables. Now we're looking up here. Get up here. You know what? Something's still connected here. Oh no, that's just, that's the shift linkage, isn't it? So it's just hanging there. Okay. Um, everything's clear, everything's clear here, so. Okay, ready? Let's continue on up. Keep an eye on things. Wow, the front of my, oh that one is. Got a lot of weight back here behind the, yeah, a lot of weight back here behind the axle on my, where my toolbox is at. Okay, body and frame are separated. All right, so here we are, probably six and a half to seven hours into the project. The body's obviously off. The engine, the 3.8 engine, 42 RLE transmission, 241 OR transfer case. Everything's out of the chassis. All my exhaust is out of the chassis. So I just backed it out and pressure washed everything. And it's still a little wet, but it's drying off. And actually, the chassis is in pretty good shape. It had a little dirt and uh, dirt that had collected around the fuel pump there and around the, the EVAP um, connection there at the back of the tank and down in the looms and everything along here. But it pressure washed up really, really nice. So um, once this dries off, I should be able to start uh, getting ready to drop the new motor and drivetrain in. 
I say it really cleaned up, really cleaned up well. I've kept the engine bay and everything pressure washed and cleaned, but there's really not much you can do on this top section of the chassis where it's underneath the body there, but um, it's in good shape. So I'll get ready to relocate my evap canister back to the void back there in front of that rear cross member behind the fuel tank. So this uh, bay pretty much concludes phase one, which is the uh, teardown. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, give me a thumbs up and I welcome the comments. Thank you very much.